Thank you all for coming. We're glad that uh, everybody is back this morning. Um, We're in our next to the last session in the book of Luke. We're in the 24th chapter of Luke today. This is the next to the last chapter of a session of the study. We have one more next week. And then the next week we start our summer session, which is Job and Ecclesiastes. So I have books for everybody. Hopefully have enough books for everybody next week. If not, we can get some more maybe. So we're chapter 24? We're chapter 24, yeah. So Luke chapter 24, beginning around verse 13. So the title of the session today is called Revealed. So to start with, I have a question for you. How many of you have ever, as kids maybe, or with your kids or grandkids, have ever watched cartoons, and as you're watching the cartoons, they're trying to solve a problem, and all of a sudden, above one of the individual's heads in the cartoon, what appears? Little dots. Little dot or a light bulb. Yeah, yeah. light bulb. You ever seen the light bulb? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, like, oh yeah. I got the idea. I know yeah. what the answer is. Figured it out. I figured it out. Ever had that happen to you? Yes. I just did a minute ago. Just did a minute ago. <laughs> so this is a, not a new sensation for you then, huh? Okay. Well, it happens to a lot of us. We all have issues and things that we have tried to figure out, maybe in school or in work or just at home, and you can't figure it out, and then all of a sudden something clicks, And I don't think there's a light bulb that goes on over your head, probably. But there's a light bulb that goes off inside your head, maybe, more likely. And it's like, all right, I know what to do. And you've solved the problem. Well, today's session is the Road to Emmaus. And it's a light bulb going off session for a couple of disciples. So as we start, let's take a couple of minutes and kind of review what's happened up until this point. Um, If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the Thursday night. We looked at the Lord's Supper. From the Lord's Supper, Jesus takes the disciples, or 11 of the disciples, from Jerusalem down through the Valley of Kidron up into the Mount of Olives and to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays for his disciples. After that, the crowd comes, they arrest him. Sometime early morning, on what would have been Friday morning, um, he is then taken back to the high priest's house. He goes through a series of four trials. After those four trials, he is turned over to the Roman soldiers for crucifixion. Nine o'clock on Friday morning. Talked about this last week. Nine o'clock on Friday morning. He is actually nailed to the cross and crucified. At noon, darkness descends over the face of the earth until 3 o'clock, at which point Jesus voluntarily gives up his spirit and dies. And you remember we talked last week, some people have tried to say, okay, that was an eclipse. And as I said last week, I don't know of any eclipse where there's total darkness for three hours. And I've been in a number of total eclipses, and it don't doesn't track. So we talked about the symbolism of the total darkness. So anyway, 3 o'clock, Jesus has died, and sometime between 3 and 6, approximately 6 o'clock, his body is taken down by Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus, and they place the body into the tomb, and then we have the Sabbath day. Nothing happens on the Sabbath. Everything is quiet. And then on Sunday morning, the women go to the tomb, and what do they find? Nothing. Nothing. Cloths are all nicely folded up and laid out, but the women find nothing. They'll go back and talk to the disciples, and do the disciples believe them? No. Not really. Women's testimony was not... um, trustworthy, I guess I would say. I'm going to be nice about it. They did not trust women's testimony, even though Old Testament times, two witnesses were supposed to prove something. Women's testimony was kind of disallowed. 
But if you remember, Peter and John go to the tomb. What do they find? Nothing. Nothing. When they come back, do the disciples believe them? Eh, maybe. It's kind of like, we don't understand what's going on, but okay, we'll take your word for it that there's nothing there. But we're not real sure what else is happening. Well, at this point, we pick up with our story for today. So as we start, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start by looking at verses 13 to 17. Now, 13 to 17 is not in the session today. It's not part of the core, but it kind of sets up the scene. And we kind of need to have the setup to understand what else is going to happen. So this is from the Holman, starting at verse 13 out of Luke 24. Now that same day, so Easter Sunday, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, seven miles from Jerusalem means they had about a three or four hour walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus over dusty, rough roads. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked this, What is this dispute that you are having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. Think about it for a minute. As we start looking at the discussion between Jesus and these two disciples, they had three to four hours, approximately, concentrated time with Jesus on the morning of his resurrection. Yet they did not know who he was. Now, why did they not know who he was? Come up with all kinds of reasons. Maybe they were so discouraged they just didn't recognize him. Maybe they didn't want to recognize Maybe they didn't want, maybe they didn't expect him. So if you don't expect somebody, you can kind of maybe pass over that this is the person that you thought you knew. And they were going to Emmaus. We're going to find out in a few minutes, but they probably lived in Emmaus. So maybe they did not have as much of a contact with Jesus as some of the other disciples. But they were disciples. But they didn't recognize who he was. So let's pick up at verse 18, and we will talk about what they talked about that day. So Luke chapter 24, let's look at verses 18 to 24. Beverly, I think you have New International, right? How about reading it from the New International? Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do you not know the things that have happened there these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Okay, beginning with verse 18. Then the one named Cleophas answered him. Luke is the only, again, gospel account that gives this extensive a narrative about this visit. Remember, I've said a number of times, you have to take all four Gospels and read the accounts to get everything that happens. Now, if you look at Mark, Mark chapter 16, there is a two-verse summary of this that Luke takes, in my Bible, half a page to talk about. Mark gives it two verses. Luke is the only one that goes into detail about this particular one. Now, it does note that uh, previously there are two disciples in this group. 
Remember what I said about the need for two people? That, Why? Why two people? So somebody can be a witness. It takes two people in the Old Testament or New Testament times we are here to verify that something is true. But it so, better not be a woman. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Susan. Susan said it better not be a woman. Because who is the second disciple? Nobody names it. Oh, maybe it was a woman. Maybe it was a woman. Some biblical scholars, since he, they're going home to Emmaus, uh -huh. some biblical scholars have speculated that this was actually Cleopas and his wife oh. who went, who he's talking to, which would explain, which would explain why Cleopas is the only one doing the talking. Oh yes. Because in that culture. A woman did not talk to an unknown male. So, some speculation that this was Cleopas and his wife. Don't know that. No name is mentioned. But they went home and they went to the same house. So, somehow or other, they are probably related. And the most obvious way would be husband and wife. But, again, we don't know that. Speculation? Sounds good. But it's speculation. But what is Cle Cleopas? He's a he's asking me. Is he a disciple? Cleopas is one, and the other one are its disciples. So that would mean the lady was a disciple. Yes. Okay. And but if you think about it, but as they, time goes on, women become yes. more and more important in the Christian church. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's just they didn't probably live there and. Yeah. They, yeah. they were going home to Emmaus, so they could probably. Speculation is that they joined the disciples at Passion Sunday uh -huh. when they came in on the triumphal entry and were in Jerusalem for the week of Passover. And now that things are, if you will, settling down, they're going home. Okay. That's speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, James, weren't there a lot of disciples and there were 12 apostles? Yeah. Isn't that? Well, there were th hundreds and probably thousands of disciples, people right. who were following. Jesus as a prophet or a teacher. I think yeah. When they talk yeah. about apostles, particularly yeah. in the apostles. New Testament, and it's a capital A, they're talking about the inner circle. They're talking about the 12, or the 11 minus Judas. So Cleopas says, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these last days? It had to be the talk of the town you know, the last couple of days, what had happened. And you're the only one that doesn't know what's happened. And Jesus then says in verse 19, what things, he asked them. Well, he's not asking for information at this point. Jesus knows what happened. He was there. Uh, he was really probably looking for some information of how they viewed what happened. This was a chance for the two disciples to tell Jesus how they viewed the events of the last week and particularly the events of the last few days. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. They are concentrating at this point on Jesus's humanity. How do they identify him? Anybody? Don't think too hard about it. How do they identify him? When they see him? No. Here in this verse, he says the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So they're identifying him with yes. his hometown. Yeah. He's a, they're going to say in a minute, he's a prophet, a teacher, but they identify him with his hometown. So they've identified him by, if you will, his human side. And remember, the question, what things... Jesus is really trying to get at what is their understanding of who he was. So their answer is, well, he was Jesus, guy from Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. The last three months or so on Wednesday night, uh, we did a study on world religions. And in those world religions, there are a lot of the world's religions that identify Jesus as a prophet or a great teacher or a guru, depending on 
which religion we're talking about, a master. They all acknowledge him as a teacher. Christianity is the only one that acknowledges him as a messiah. So here, he's from Nazareth. He was a prophet. He taught, and we've talked about this a number of times before, he taught with authority. He didn't quote other rabbis, which was the way most of them taught back then. Basically quoted himself. Face it. The Bible is from God and Jesus, who knew it better than the guy who wrote it. So he didn't quote other people. He quoted himself. Powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. So everybody acknowledged the fact that he was a powerful teacher. He was a healer. He did many supernatural things. But at this point, at least, nobody has acknowledged him as the Messiah. Now, I'll grant you, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Peter, uh, where he says, you are the Christ. But even Peter at that point didn't understand the entire magnitude of what that statement meant. Okay, verse 20 and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him I can almost hear the shame in their voices that our leaders are the ones that did it now who actually did the crucifixion the Romans the Romans they were the only ones who were authorized to administer the death penalty so the Romans are the ones that actually did the act. But these two disciples acknowledge it was our chief priests and leaders. It was our religious leaders who actually demanded the death penalty and actually turned him over to the Romans for execution. Now here comes what they were hoping for. Remember, the question Jesus asked is to figure out what they think he was there for. And so far they concentrated on his humanity. And here's what they were hoping for in verse 21. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. We've talked about what they meant by redeeming Israel. Anybody remember? Taking over and beating up the Romans and okay. being the king. Being the king and throwing the Romans out. Right. We're going to restore the kingdom as it was in David's time. We're going to be a Middle Eastern power. We're going to get rid of the Romans. We're going to have God's Messiah on the throne. Everything's going to be like it was in King David's time. That's what they were looking for. And honestly, if you remember just before the triumphal entry, the disciples and the apostles were looking for the same thing. Because he was going to Jerusalem and he was asked, are you going to bring in the kingdom at this time? But they were looking for a political kingdom. They were looking for, let's get rid of the Romans and let's put him on the throne and everything is going to be great again. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened. What's important about the third day? He's going to rise, he's going to rise again. Okay. Well, he has told them he's going to raise, rise again on the third day, but they aren't thinking about that. There's another reason for the third day being here. What happens on the fourth day? Anybody remember the story of Lazarus? They believe that the soul goes up to heaven. If you remember, Jesus doesn't get to Lazarus' house until the fourth day. Because according to Jewish tradition, after three days, as Bone said, the soul leaves the body and there's no possibility of resurrection. They felt at that time that first three days after death, there was a possibility of resuscitation. He might come back to life again. After the fourth day, forget it. You're dead and you stay dead. But Jesus, as I think Beverly said just now, he told them, I'm going to rise again on the third day. And it had only been three days. So they were a little impatient.
22. Moreover, some women from our group astonished us. Who are the women? Mary Magdalene. Mary, James. mother of Jesus, yeah. Mary Magdalene. The uh, other ones that went to the tomb first thing in the morning. Now, since it says here, moreover, some of the women from our group astonished us, these two disciples probably were not just casual disciples. They were probably um, very serious disciples because if some of the women in our group astonished us, where were these two disciples probably on Sunday morning? In the upper room. In the upper room. So they were part of the group, if you will, in hiding with the apostles. So they would not have just been casual disciples. They would have been very serious disciples of Jesus and had heard him talk because they were in the group where the women came back. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find the body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who were with us, some of those being... Who, who went? Two women. No, besides the women, who are the two guys that went? Uh, Peter and John. Peter and John. So the women had come back and astonished them, and then some of those who were with us, Peter and John, went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said. They verified the women's testimony, but they didn't see him. They didn't even mention if they saw an angel or anything. The disciples wanted proof positive that Jesus was alive. Just because the tomb was empty, granted, if you remember, there's a big stone rolled in front of it mm -hmm. that no person could move and it's removed and the cloths are all folded up Neither. but they didn't see a real <laughs> live person they just saw an empty tomb so they wanted proof positive of what had happened so what does Jesus do after this 25 to 27 Susan would you read those sure he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Okay. Verse 25. Jesus, he said to them, "How in my version, hold one, how unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts. And I think yours said how foolish, how foolish you are and slow to believe. Yeah, so does the King, New King James says okay. foolish. Okay, it says foolish. The word they translate foolish here doesn't mean unintelligent or silly. It's really the idea, and mine says unwise, which is, I think, really a better translation for the meaning they're looking for here. Because the meaning they're looking for here is, you're missing the obvious, people. I said I was going to rise in three days. You go to the tomb, and it's empty. What would you expect? I wasn't going to be there. I told you that. So it doesn't mean they're silly or unintelligent. They're just not seeing the obvious. And then he talks about how slow to believe, and it says slow to believe in your heart. Well, you don't think with your heart. You think with your head. But again, in context and in the culture, the idea of thinking with your heart or slow to believe in your heart, it's the idea of your total being. You're missing the obvious people, and I've told you this, you've understood it, but did you understand it? All that the prophets have spoken, didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? The way that is written when it talks about um, didn't, uh, didn't you believe that they had to suffer all these things, the idea here is it was preordained. And how many times has Jesus told them what's going to happen has been preordained? If you think back over it, he's told them multiple times because we've talked about it multiple times. That he has said, this is what's been ordained. This is what's going to happen to me. And it's all part of our plan for the redemption of the world. I'm going to 
be tried, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be raised from the dead in three days. This is what's going to happen. And sometimes he showed his frustration a little bit, like, yeah. how long am I going to have to be with this unbelieving generation, you know? How long am I going to have to tell you this before yeah. you realize, I really mean this is what's going to happen. Yeah. This yeah. is the sequence of events. And then it says, and enter into his glory. Now, depending on the topical scholar you're talking to, enter into his glory comes up with a number of meanings. All of them are, are plausible. It could be all of them when he's talking here, to enter into his glory. One, his resurrection. Resurrection showed uh, victory over death. So that could be his glory. Secondly, here in a few weeks, he's going to ascend to heaven. He's going back to the Father. That could be enter into his glory. And others have said it really refers to his second coming when he comes in power. All three of those are possible. It could be all three of those. They all make sense. And then verse 27, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted from thing, for them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. Again, just recently we were doing a study on Wednesday night of the gospel as revealed in the book of Genesis. And one of the things we said at the very beginning of that study is that the Bible is not a bunch of uh, separated stories, myths, books. It is one story from Malachi, uh, excuse me, from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation. Amen. The whole Bible is one story, one gospel if it's interpreted correctly. So Jesus starts with the prophets and Moses. So Moses, the first five books of the Bible. The prophets, the last 10 or 12 books of the Bible. And he talks about all of the different ways that he has fulfilled prophecy. And if you remember last week, we looked at the crucifixion and we looked at about five or six different places in the Old Testament where the crucifixion fulfills prophecy from the Old Testament. Uh, one of the biggest prophecies we talked about a number of months ago when we did Isaiah, and that was Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant. For the Jews of the time, the story of Isaiah's suffering servant was interpreted as the nation of Israel, as God's suffering servant. In reality, it was the story of Jesus. And if you read through Isaiah 53, there are a lot of references there that you can see fulfilled in the crucifixion and Jesus' life. Yeah. Isn't, isn't really Isaiah over the whole 66 books of the Bible, basically? If you look through Isaiah, doesn't it pretty much cover the whole, all the books of the Bible, all the way through Revelations? That's kind of... I'm not sure I would say that, but I... I don't dispute that there are a lot of things in Isaiah that are reflected in the New Testament because a lot of Paul and a lot of other New Testament writers quoted Isaiah. Right. Particularly Isaiah 53. Right, exactly. Because again, it was trying to interpret the Old Testament in light of the new <coughs> revelation, the revelation of Jesus. Sure. So I think they quoted it. I, I won't say that it that Isaiah is the overarching uh, book of the Bible, and I will say it's quoted an awful lot right. by New Testament writers. And Jesus quoted Isaiah. So it was an important book. I, there's no doubt on that. <coughs> okay. 28 to 31. John, would you read those, please? 28 to 31. <coughs> and they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he would go further. And they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about that when he had reclined at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Okay. They came near the village. What's the name of the village? Emmaus. Luke didn't have to say it again. He'd already told them where they were going. Uh, they came near the village where they were going, 
and he gave the impression that he was going farther. So again, time frame here. Um, Mary and the women went to the tomb at dawn. So they had to wait for daylight. So let's say 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm just taking hours, but 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, daylight. They come back and tell the disciples. Peter and John go. They come back. It's got to be mid-morning or so. Late morning, I would think. By the time Peter and John come back and these two disciples have heard all the stories and now they've decided, well, nothing else is going to happen. So we're going to go home. And it's a three or four hour walk to Emmaus. And that whole time, they're talking to Jesus. He's explaining the scriptures to them, trying to have them see the full scope of his mission. So by the time they get to where the road turns off to Emmaus, and this is just my picture, the road goes on, and here's the little side trail that goes to Emmaus. They're getting ready to go home. So it's late afternoon, and Jesus continues to walk. Uh, I haven't looked at a map over here recently just to see how close, what comes after Emmaus, but I'm assuming that it's going to be a little bit before you get to another city. And it ain't safe to travel at night on this road. If you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, robbers and thieves lay in wait. It's not a good time to travel at night. And Jewish culture was one of hospitality to the strangers. So as they are nearing the village and Jesus looks like he's going to go further, they urge him to stay with us because it's almost evening. Evening would be 5, 6 o'clock. And the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, it, it's more than just stopping for a meal. We're getting to the close of the day, and they urge him to stay with us. Again, the word, I think, New, Inter New International, Beverly, does it say abide? Uh, Verse 29. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. Okay. That's what New, the New, King James New King James says, abide. Abide, abide yeah. really gives you a more of a, an idea than to stay. Because the idea was here not just come and have a meal and go to an end or we'll take you to an end or something. Jewish hospitality demanded that you put the guy up for the night. Remember we talked about when Mary and Joseph goes to uh, Bethlehem mm -hmm. for the birth that they couldn't find a room in a relative's house because back then you were expected to, there weren't inns. You were expected to kind of put up the stranger if they came to your door. Mm -hmm. So these two disciples, and again, I like the idea that it's husband and wife. Just just me. I like the idea it's husband and wife. They're definitely related because they're staying in the same house. Uh, invite Jesus in for a meal and to stay with them for the night. And it will take a little while. It's not like they had a servant already prepared the meal. So they would have had a time as Jesus came into the house with them for him to rest you know, I can see them treating him as an honored guest because they have been listening to him. I think they would have acknowledged at this point that this guy is a good teacher. We learned a lot from him. Uh, we're understanding more and more. So they've had time to kind of digest maybe a little bit of what they've talked about. And the meal's prepared, and now they're going to prepare to eat the meal. And it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Now, kind of strange here, because this is Cleopas' house. Normally, he would be the host at the meal, but Jesus takes over the position of host. And some biblical scholars have kind of pointed to the similarity of this verse with what happened in the upper room. Now, there's no indication that the disciples, apostles, had told the disciples about what happened in the upper room. And there's nothing here that says he took a cup, because the cup was part of the Lord's Supper. There's no indication that he talked about the symbolism of the bread. You know, unless the apostles had talked to the disciples when they were all gathered in the upper room, we don't know of any of that happening. But some biblical scholars have pointed to the similarity of the words that Luke uses to point to some similarities between the first communion, first Lord's Supper, and what happens here. But he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to him. 
And then their eyes were opened. Now, doesn't mean literally open as in they were blind, but figuratively, their eyes were open. They recognized who he was. Like that light went on. In yeah, the like the little light. light bulb over the head went on. Yeah. How many times, if these were serious disciples, how many times had they seen Jesus do this exact same act? You think about the feeding of the 5,000, there's the feeding of the 2,000, there's numerous times when Jesus broke bread, blessed it, and gave it to crowds. Well, like when he was the boat was sinking and he said, wind stop. You know, the ocean stand, you know, be still, and it did it. I mean, oh my Lord. Mm -hmm. They'd seen it a number of times. So this was the moment where they understood who this really was. And then he disappeared from their sight. The writer makes a couple of points for why did he disappear from their sight. Biggest reason, I think, is what happens next. And it's not in what you studied. Verse 32 says, So they said to each other, One our hearts ablaze within us when he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scripture to us. And that very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Think about that for a minute. They've sat down to supper. Six, seven o'clock, Jesus disappears. If he'd have stayed with them, they would have stayed right there with him. But by disappearing, what did they do? They went up and went to Jerusalem. Three or four hour walk. They just walked three or four hours. Now they're going to walk three or four hours back to Jerusalem. And it's late at night. It's and it's at night. Yeah. Right, Bert. It's at night. And mine had looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. in the new so... They're going back at night after walking three or four hours. They're going to go back so they can tell everybody else. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has certainly been raised and they have appeared, has appeared to Simon. And then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. So this, they get back and this time if the disciples in the upper room are wanting proof positive, i.e. we saw the body, guess what? They got it. These guys had actually seen the risen, resurrected Christ. So there's the witness that they needed. And next week, we get the rest of the story. Because <laughs> next week, as they're talking... Jesus shows up behind locked doors. And then everybody sees the resurrected body. Okay. Uh, any side notes? Bible notes? Anything that I maybe didn't say that for the group that needs to come up? One thing I yeah. got. Go ahead. I got from that book I told you about. Uh huh. Uh, you know, you, we were talking about prophecy and how Jesus said about prophecy. It went back to uh, Simeon's prophecy, and it starts in Luke two uh, twenty five. But what they what they go to is. Of course, that's when they bring in, um, I, well, in 25 it said, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would see the death see death before he would see the Lord Lord the Lord's Christ. Uh -huh. So he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in child Jesus to do for him according to custom for the uh, for the law he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 
Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. So, you know, they, they were pointing that this, that, that was pointing to this as a prophecy. Yeah. And then in 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. And then they pointed to 38. Right. And they said, and in the coming instance, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, 38, you know, the two disciples talk about we thought he would be the one who would redeem Israel. And in Luke 238, talks about the redemption of Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is symbolism, if you will, for the nation of Israel. Right. So the redemption here, Anna foresaw it. This is what they were expecting. It's just a matter of what kind of redemption are we looking for. Right, exactly. And it wasn't what they expected. Yeah, exactly. Okay, anybody else with something? It's about all of them believe except one. All of them at that point believed except one because he wasn't there. But Thomas gets taken care of later. <laughs> Thomas gets taken care of later. Okay. Anybody else? Is that the Daddy Thomas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. Okay, then let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to look at your word. We thank you that we have the blessing of hindsight to know the complete story of your life and time here on earth and what you have commissioned us to do. Thank you for your life, for your death, your resurrection. As we go our way, may we be lights to the world to show that to others. For we ask it in your name. Amen.